Okay, I've got top of the hour. Good morning, everybody. Uh, those of you on the East Coast, 11 a.m. West Coast, it's 8 a.m. Um, my name is Tom Lewis, and we are at the halfway point of our 20 for 2020 webinar series. Uh, episode 10 today is all about NFPA 1911 and 1915, inspecting, testing, and maintaining apparatus. So welcome, everyone. Uh, glad, you, glad to have you all here. And uh, we're going to make it a good uh, good presentation today, and I hope you'll be able to take away some good things for your department. So we're going to go over a quick introduction, um, we'll go over our objective, and we try to keep it very straightforward and simple. And uh, we've got a couple poll questions for you we'll run here in a little bit. Um, we'll give a quick emergency reporting background in the event there are people that are new to the emergency reporting family with us today. Quick overview of our system features, and then we'll dive right into rig checks and then an overall high-level look at NFPA 1911 and 1915. But before we get started, let me uh, run a couple polls here. First of all, I'd like to know a little bit about you all. And you'll see on your screen, which type of agency do you work for? Are you guys career, volunteer, combo, federal, or DOD? All right, we got people voting fast today. And I see a few new names on the list, so great. And, and I know Kervin's been with us for many of, so we're Kervin, good to see you again. But a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of new names on the list, so good to have you guys here today. All right, looks like everybody's voted, and our mix today is most interesting. We've got half volunteer and about half that are combo, and then a little bit of career. So fantastic. All right, here comes a couple more. So are you currently an ER customer? Or are you interested in joining the ER family? You guys are fast, awesome. Okay, here we go. All right, so a couple are interested in joining the ER family. So great, so you're, you're not a current customer. So I will take a couple minutes um, for those that are brand new to just do a quick high level look at who we are and uh, what we have to offer, fantastic. All right, let's do that real quick. That's me, um, retired battalion chief out of Southern Arizona. Been with emergency reporting since 2004. Uh, started as a trainer, both regionally in the States and then branched out into the international and Department of Defense, Defense realm. I am now currently a business development analyst for our biz dev team, um, a subject matter expert for our sales team as well, and I get the privilege to go out and do presentations. In fact, uh, those of you that are initially registered for this saw that it was yesterday, and I had to do a turn and burn trip to Los Angeles for a presentation. And so I got back late last night, and uh, here I am this morning, so hopefully I'm wired up on enough coffee. So those of you that had to change your schedule a little bit, we normally do these on Thursday. I want to thank you for jumping in today and uh, coming on a Friday. So we'll make, we'll make this worth your time today. and and uh, respect your time, get in, get this done, and let you get back to, to the work you have at your department. So thank you for that. And uh, yeah, so that's me. Uh, here's our objective for today. And again, those of you that have been with me previously know I like to keep this real straightforward. And that's our objective. How do I improve my overall apparatus inspection, testing, and maintenance so that I better adhere to NFPA 1911 and 1915? And while this is not a class or a presentation about those standards, it's how I want to give you enough of an introduction about those standards so that you can go and reference them and kind of be a leader in your organization when it comes to, okay, if we want to do better in certain parts of our department, and in this case, it's about your apparatus maintenance and such, chances are there is an NFPA standard for it. NFPA, National Fire Protection Association, is the uh, clearinghouse um, and developer of national standards that govern a lot of what we do. And whether or not we realize it, um, a lot of the decisions we make, a lot of the things you see in literature, a lot of the design going into our apparatus are based on these standards. Um, there's one for the design of apparatus, which we certainly not, won't get into today, but these two are critical. And I would strongly recommend your engineers, if they haven't already, look at these standards because it will guide them. And if they have any questions on what they should or shouldn't be doing when it comes to their vehicles, these standards cover it quite nicely. All right, so for the benefit of those that are brand new to um, emergency reporting and they're just kind of getting to know us, we currently serve, and this number keeps going up, this is an old slide, but we're almost at 6,800 departments. 
um, the number of files that have been reported in our system, incidents reported in our system, surpassed 36 million, and we're almost at, we're pushing a half a million personnel total in the system. These are our pillars, and today we're going to talk about compliance with NFPA standards, operations allowing you to basically run your entire department using our system, and then for me, these bottom two, and it makes it easy to remember because you can think of the word CORD, C-O-R-D, but for me, this is the top one, building relationships with all of you and knowing that data drives the fire service, but really it's humans in the driver's seat. And we never, we try to never forget that because we can get immersed, sometimes analysis paralysis, as they call it, with all the data that we're trying to digest, managing our departments. And of course, Clearly, we can only make good decisions if good data is going into the system, and hence that's why it's our fourth pillar. But it's really about the relationships, and that's how we grow our company and, and uh, stay strong with, with all of you out, of, out in the field using a, our product. So we have 16 modules. Um, those of you that are customers are well aware of, of most of them. Um, we have a very robust partner interface, uh, partner interfaces with our APIs, um, application programming interface. And um, those of you that aren't techies, um, that just means it's the way that other software, so say your scheduling program, um, your, um, boy, I, I stayed up way too late traveling, um, but primarily your scheduling program is, is one of the ways of inspection programs, um, if you're using something else, um, can talk to our system, uh, incident management programs, I'm getting on a roll now, can basically that software using the API platform can reach in and pull data out of our system if it's needed in their system or push data into our system if we need it. And it has that communication oftentimes back and forth between the two products. CAD interface, there's just, just about every CAD out there we interface with, which means data populates directly into your incident module without having to do as much manual entry. As an example, my department, we went for, and from when we started ER in 2004-ish, we didn't have a CAD interface for about five, six years. So when we finally got it, there was a, a uh, just a lot of joy because it was less time doing incidents. It'll knock it down by 15, 20 minutes or more per report because so many of the fields that heretofore we had to manually enter, you know, key, keyboard strokes and mouse clicks were now being auto-populated from the CAD. So it is a very nice uh, part of our system that allows you to minimize the time in front of a computer when you want to be out there helping Mrs. Smith, but not fires and and uh, doing what you got into this job for in the first place. We have over 600 system reports. Those are what people call CAN reports. I like to call them system reports because they do have some parameters that you can select and, and filter. Um, while And then we have, um, again, the compliance part, our ability to analyze our performance as an organization against NFPA 1710, 1720, and then of course NFPA 1500. Um, one thing I want to recommend to those of you that are customers is to go into the analytics module. All of you have this now in your account. It is, you'll see there uh, response analytics, safety analytics, and now BI basic. And that's our business intelligence tool. The initial release is out. Everyone gets it. Um, we, were, we are working towards uh, what's called Business Intelligence Pro, which will be an upgrade that we expect to see come by the end of the year, or early 2021, which will provide what a lot of you have been asking for, a more of ad hoc type reporting. Let's get into the, today's program, and I love this quote. Um, those of you that have been on my presentations before know that I am... Um, uh, I consider uh, Chief Brunacini uh, a mentor. I've been privileged to work with him a little bit, not on Phoenix Fire, of course. I didn't work for Phoenix Fire, but he did come out to our National Training Academy and do a wonderful presentation. Uh, and I love this quote, and this kind of helps uh, set the stage for what we're going to talk about today. Fire trucks are godlike vehicles that should always be over-maintained as a labor, labor of love, personal and professional, so that they can protect good and fight evil. Uh, that's just Chief Brunacini. But again, we love our we love our apparatus. Um, they define us in many ways. They identify us um, as an organization to the community, and the the uh, the pride that you put into them um, kind of defines uh, helps define the organization too. You know, you can you've been to departments um, that and seen departments where they just 
these are old vehicles. In fact, I was in California yesterday. I'll tell you, they drove, they were doing a big photo shoot down at the pier at, at uh, Manhattan Beach, the departments in the agency. And there was an old, and I think it was El Segundo, um, one of the departments in the area. It was an older apparatus, easily, easily from the 90s. But that thing was immaculate. The hose bed, the, and you know what I'm talking about when you, the, the four or five inch hose, hose bed in the back of the truck was perfect. You know, they didn't have a hose cover on it, but just, so the hose was exposed. Those little things you notice and help define both the organization, let you know the pride and ownership that they take in their vehicles. So it's pretty neat to see that. It doesn't matter how old the truck is either. So here's the standards we're going to cover today. And when I say cover, it's really going to be how you can adhere to them within emergency reporting. The first one, NFPA 1911, and I'm going to actually go to these standards here in a bit, but this is just a quick slide. It's the standard for the inspection, maintenance, testing, and retirement of in-service emergency vehicles. All right, so there's a lot here. There is a lot in this document that is going to be geared towards your technicians and, and your engineers. However, when in doubt on what you should be doing day to day, especially when it comes to the inspection, okay, and the maintenance of uh, uh, apparatus, it's in this document. And we'll go to a couple pages and I want to show you, whoops. Uh, but this one, this on chapter seven, paragraph two, this gives you a summary of what the visual check should be on your daily check. Those of you that um, have a truck form or rig check form, this can be a jump in point for it. Now, you probably, many of you probably already have a form, but you can benchmark it against what the standard says and make sure that you're truly covering everything that the standard has. And there's always an element of the CYA from a legal perspective when it comes to documenting what you're doing with your apparatus. Because uh, my department had an unfortunate incident where we had a failure of a 100 foot aerial ladder platform. It was up at about a 45 degree angle, fully extended. So you've got the hydraulic fly sections, then you've got the mechanical um, last fly, that's cable and pulley. Well, that failed. That fly, that section of the aerial came down like an elevator shaft. We had civilians in the bucket, and thankfully they were tied in with a safety harness, otherwise I would probably talk, be talking to you about fatalities. But because they were all tied in, um, they did sustain injuries. There were civilians, some were elderly, all, and, and um, had pretty debilitating injuries, but thankfully there was no loss of life. Uh, and so one of the things post that incident was okay anything anybody that would conduct begin conducting an investigation is going to want to see what the documentation both of the maintenance records and the vehicle checks well at that point we were doing everything on a clipboard paper you know so you've got the truck check forms you know laid out maybe in a weekly grid you fill it out manually pen and paper then it goes into a filing cabinet. Well, you pull those documents out and you'll notice there's missing fields, uh, missing days even. Well, people ran calls. They put, um, our guys were great at checking the trucks, but the documentation was less than optimal. And so that came, that was, well, I say held against us and, and such. It was not, we were not placed in a favorable light as a result of it. So that leads me to the next question for you all. Do you follow NFPA 1911 and 1915? And I'll tell you, talk about 1915 here shortly. And so, yes, no, sort of, or, and this is okay, what, what's NFPA 1911 and 1915? So think about that for a second. And we'll see what we've got. They're trickling in. And the yes doesn't have to be 100%. It means you have introduced these standards to your organization. If I were to come visit your organization and ask an engineer, hey, do you know what NFPA 1911 is? They would be able to say, yeah, it's the guide that we use for you know, keeping our trucks in good shape. All right. No means you don't even know what it is. Sort of means you follow probably elements of these but maybe not to the letter. And, and keep in mind, here's the thing people kind of freak out about in the fire service when it comes to these NFPA standards is, I have yet to see a department that adheres to all of them or most of them even 100%. It is something you're continually striving for and you're doing your best to adhere as best as possible. Um, and this is one of them. And you'll see when I get into the standard how much is involved here. Great, everybody, we've got everybody voting. Here's the results. Okay, so we've got, yeah, sort of, and that's, 
kind of what I expected. You're doing things and you're probably doing a pretty good job, but there's always room for improvement. And thankfully, probably because I just did that slide, um, you know a little bit about at least what NFPA 1911 is. Awesome, all right, next slide is this standard hasn't been updated and it, it has some redundancies with 1911, but I highlighted those two sections on the um, right from the introduction. I like what NFPA says, it's the minimum requirements for establishing a PM program for fire apparatus. And then at the end of the day, and I, I, I highlighted this for one reason and one reason alone. We're in the fire service, change does not come easy. The first question that comes out of almost everyone's mouth in the fire department when something new is introduced or something has changed is why? Right there in the lower right is the why. It's all about keeping them safe and keeping the vehicles in a safe operating condition and are ready for response at all times. No one can argue with that. We want our trucks to be in that state always. Um, and we know that the trucks do go in and out of service for sure. But one of the things, if you are thinking of introducing anything new in the department, and I'm learning this, I learned this as a captain and as a, and as a battalion chief, and I see it day to day. In fact, it was part of our conversation yesterday in California was, you've got to introduce the whys behind it. If you satisfy that innate need to know why by the troops, usually you will get a stronger buy-in and a better understanding of, uh, of what's gonna be taking place and a smoother implementation of something new or simply that, hey guys, if you haven't read 1911 or 1915, that's gonna be a little bit of homework and maybe some rainy day training at the day room, um, especially for officers and for engineers. So just something to consider there. Last poll question, how do you document your checks and your, and your maintenance of your vehicles? Mostly paper. You use truck checks, which was our initial solution for documenting daily apparatus, um, weekly apparatus checks. It is from our partnership with Halligan. Now we have our new ER rig checks, which I'm a big fan of. Or do you use like other software, some, some other program, spreadsheets, Microsoft Word docs, Google docs? All right, guys, thanks for voting. This is looking good. A few more multitaskers look up real quick. All right, gonna close in three, two, one. Ah, most interesting, I like this. So some are still using paper. And what I'm hoping to show you today, based on, because, based on what NFPA 1911 and 15 to talk about, um, the paper, that's how we did it. And in some ways, paper's faster, but I'm gonna show you how our rig checks can be just as fast and kind of fun and do a better job of documentation in that event you've got to go back and pool all those truck checks and uh, and maintenance records. And then you're using our rig checks, half of you, fantastic. And then um, other software, spreadsheets, Microsoft Word Docs, Google Docs. So in the questions, those of you that selected that, just type in and say, hey, I use such and such, whether it's the program or if you're still using spreadsheets. I know some use on mobile devices, Google Docs, they've created forms. So just put in the questions um, what you do, those of you that answered that. All right, that will do it for our uh, that will do it for our polls, and I do want to direct you to your go to webinar control panel. There is a handout section, and this is particularly uh, good for um, those of you in the poll that submitted that you're new to the ER family and just want to learn more about us. There's a handout there that summarizes all of what we offer, so it just kind of goes into a little bit more detail. Um, what I had uh, talked about earlier um, in the introduction. Okay, oops, hit too fast. All right, so there's the two, two things that I wanna, because this is where we excel. All right, this is how we help support this endeavor. On the left, NFPA 1911, a record of the visual and operational check sheet. So this is from the daily, weekly, monthly checks of apparatus, that section, chapter seven. A, a record shall be kept. Okay, and then NFPA 15 backs it up. Records shall be maintained on all inspections, maintenance requests, preventative maintenance, repairs, and testing results. Separate files shall be established and maintained for each individual fire apparatus. And so what our system allows you to do and, or, and be well organized with is exactly those two things. Before we get into that, let's go and look at those two standards. I wanna just show you the table of contents and show you how to access them. 
Okay, so here we are. I am in 1911. First things first is we're gonna to go to the table of contents. I was perusing this before uh, in preparation for today's presentation. But the standard, nfpa.org, it does not cost anything to view them free. Now, you can't do anything with this standard. Hopefully, your department has a subscription to NFPA, so you can either access them electronically or order the hard copies. But however you get them, even if you just want to do something from home, you can go to their site. You can log in, create an account, um, a, a, a login and password for the web access, and then you can click on free access. It will open up current versions or earlier versions. In this case, the 2017 is the one we're looking at. That will allow you to view it. And then we need to refresh. Okay. Oh, it was loading. It just, I need to be patient. Okay. Here we go. All right. First thing you want to do. So these are not what I call for me, firefighter friendly. There's no pictures, okay? It's all text, all right, which is fine. But uh, we're very visual creatures. Um, those of us in the fire service, we learn by hands-on, we like to see. So this will take discipline, but the first step in that discipline is just looking at the table of contents to get a lay of the land, all right? I always like to look at the general requirements because that will tell me kind of, whoops, do, do, do. First of all, we go here, the scope and purpose. Usually that's chapter one. This tells you the whole point of this document. Then there's tons of definitions, use a glossary and a reference point. So what do they mean by? Adjust, okay, terms like that as that they use throughout the document, okay? But I instantly gravitate to what I need to look at, daily, weekly, visual, and operational checks. What you can do is go to chapter seven and ask yourself, does my rig check form adhere to what they're stating needs to be checked here? And again, they're saying shall include, but not be limited to. So there certainly could be things on your apparatus that are not listed here, but it's very detailed. And then it does get into a, the technical aspect of the vehicle and how and what things should be checked. Now your engineers will go through much of this training. In fact, it would not surprise me if 1911 is part of the curriculum but you can use it as a reference point as well to help improve your overall program um, within your department. So that's NFPA 1911, and you can see all the things that it references. I mean, it goes deep, all right? You've got a new vehicle, new vehicle technicians. How are you gonna develop a preventative maintenance program? All right, one of the things that this talks about, and I believe it's the standard, is what defines an out-of-service vehicle? And then it also talks about um, what defines retiring a vehicle in chapter five. So this is, uh, this is just particularly interesting, and I wanna show this to you because we have a part in our system where you can set it's the life expectancy of a vehicle, okay? And so what I won't do is, I know it's in here, um, but it explains the time period um, of when vehicles should be in and out, of, um, be taken out of service. Um, and so it is in this document. Um, I'll let you find it and peruse it because I want to get into the, the meat and potatoes of today's presentation. But when in doubt on what defines something that is in or out of service, you know, day to day because of what's going wrong with the vehicle versus the overall life expectancy of a vehicle, it's, it's in this document. The other one, is 1915, it's an older standard, it's, it's getting getting pretty, it has not been updated, which leads me to believe that 1911 is more of the defining document, but this one is a little less intense and still gives you some good background on a PM program for your vehicle. And again, it goes through the standard NFPA format. So again, I can't emphasize enough, if you're an up and coming leader in your organization, um, it will behoove you to learn in your area of responsibility, the NFPA standards that govern um, what you're doing day to day. Um, at least know the standards that are most critical. And so if in this today's case, we're talking about vehicles. These are two of the most important ones, certainly 1911. And having a mastery of it will go a long way in helping keep your guys and girls safe um, out there on the rigs and keep your fleet looking fantastic, you know, 10, 15 years down the road and running fantastic. And at the end, 
yes, we love a good looking fire truck, but chances are a good looking fire truck is also a safe fire truck. All right, let's get into the system. Any questions? Let me just double check, make sure we don't have any. Thanks, Amanda, for that. So you're using the Halligan app as an alternative. Very good. Okay, so I'm in the system right now, and the things that I want to focus on um, start with the overall lay of the land on apparatus. All right, so right now, um, this is sticky. So what this means is, is I have equipment and apparatus grids. I was last visited the apparatus grid, so that's what popped up first for me here, which is exactly what I wanted. I'm gonna go ahead and expand them all, and you're gonna see that it is organized by NFP, or N, NFERS, excuse me, NFERS apparatus type. And so if I scroll down, to my engines you can see the engines in this in this account now there's no subcategories here like there is in the equipment grid you've got and and first type 11 engines there's five in this account engine one three four m1 m2 and then you can see the vehicle id and we'll talk about this vehicle id because this is critical all right hugely important um, and it sometimes provides some confusion the station it's assigned to down here, the next layer, so layer level one, category. Level two, the actual vehicle. Level three, any pending maintenance. The red text is going to show you that things are not assigned or not scheduled or past its scheduled date. If a vehicle is out of service, so let's just, for example, take it out of service so I can show you what this does. And we'll go through this whole process here on the documentation in a moment. I just wanted to show you. Then you're going to get a red warning triangle. And anytime you see that, you know there is at least one vehicle in that category that is out of service. And in this case, it's engine one. So you can see it very quickly. So before we go any further, I want to point out, and this is something you'll want to check in your own accounts. Now, if you have administrative privileges, you will have this icon. If you don't, there may just be an info, an eye icon where you can see information about the vehicle. I'm going to click into it. This is going to actually take me directly to that vehicle in the administration module. Those of you that have ever had added a manual, ad, manually added an apparatus, will know that you've got all these, many of these required fields. The key takeaways here that I want you to understand when documenting your apparatus is that the apparatus ID is the call sign. That can change. Now we have other fields here if you need to spell out engine one and then the unit call sign, we've added those. This is what appears in the drop down list in the system incidents, daily log, and such. This number here, while it's not a red or required field, is probably the most important field here because it is your asset tracking number known as the vehicle number. We called it a shop number, whatever you call it in your organization, this is the cradle to grave asset ID. It is preferable not to say it's engine one because it could become something else down the road. We use the last four of the VIN. Whatever you're tracking, however you track it, just know that that number should stay the same. And then there's reports in our system that pull from this number. So people worry, if I switch out trucks, do I need to switch this apparatus ID? My recommendation is no. Just I'll show you, teach the guys that if engine 10 is running as engine one today, it's still engine one in incidents, but it's gonna be engine 10 or nine and whatever it would be, it's vehicle number listed here when you're checking it. And we make that easy, easy to define. And so you can eliminate that confusion and administrators going in and switching this. It just turns it into, it makes it harder than it, than it has to be. And so I just wanna point that out because that's a very frequent question we get. And it's my best practice recommendation to certainly change this as, as needed when it's a permanent change, not a switch out. And then when it comes to checking and maintaining, this will serve as your guide. So again, if today engine one is running as engine 10, it's still vehicle number 9990 and all its maintenance and checks correspond to that asset. The other field I wanna mention, uh, fields I should say, is if you can put in the initial cost, the date it was in service and when you expect to replace it. Why? Because we have reports that pull from this. And so your chief can get a preliminary apparatus budget um, for any given year if you put that field in the system. A couple other fields that provide um, questions to, uh, that we get questions on. The in and out of service status is self-explanatory. 
NFPA compliance. This is this is tied into our safety analytics. So if you have safety analytics, this will allow you to see at a glance the state of your fleet. Has that vehicle been checked as expected based on its inspection frequency listed here? And has it had its annual NFPA pump test? Um, this is a mandatory field, but it only is applicable if you have safety analytics. Last one is apparatus ownership. Many of you rely, I noticed there were many volunteers uh, departments on today's presentation, may rely on neighboring agencies to meet your standards of cover. Therefore, and if you have a CAD interface, those units can certainly populate in the system and you can add them here. Just make sure you check this radio button. Why? This means that it will appear in your incident list and can come over from the CAD and populate their times so it complements your unit responses but it will not appear in the maintenance module and clutter up your maintenance grid because it's not your apparatus. So don't forget that. That's really helpful, especially if you rely on neighboring agencies to help you meet your responses. Questions here? Okay, doing good today. All right. Let's head back to the main grid. And so in keeping with 1911, the very first thing I want to talk to you about is the rig check. I'm gonna focus on that today. Before we go there, there is one thing I wanna show you that you should set up if you haven't already. In an administration, there is a key section here that will make your life very happy. Under default activity codes, of the six things that automatically populate in our system, the one not listed here are completed inspections, you need to tie in an activity code for your default rig check. What this means is every time a rig check is completed in our system, it will automatically populate into the daily log showing who did it, anything that might've been failed and how long they spent on it. So not only can you run reports against it in the maintenance module, again, keeping with NFP 1911, document, 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 the, uh, you can also run reports on uh, how much time is being spent checking these vehicles, who's doing it, and a quick look at anything that may have failed. So that's an admin and set it here. My recommendation is to type it, just write it just like this, have that activity code called rig check because it will only apply to rig checks. The, the Halligan interface uses the maintenance completed so it's commingled with any completed maintenance items. That's why I like it separated here with rig check. Okay, hope that makes sense. And the, word, and the place you do that, administrators, is again, your daily log activity code list. You'll scroll down, or not scroll down, you'll add an activity code called rig check, and you can see mine's added here. Okay, I'm gonna go visit this. We'll come back to this table and show you a maintenance request, but on rig check. And one of the other things I want to show you here, well, I'll show you here in a minute, is how to do it on a smartphone because it's designed for uh, for smartphones. Okay, so lay of the land, filter. If I wanna just find engine one, I can do that. Anything with NGE in it, I can do that, E dash. Okay, you can enter that, or I need to find vehicle 9990. That's your search. You can also filter all apparatus or just my current assigned station. So let's clear that out. And I just wanna see current station or the station that I assigned to me. It's essentially the same filter here. Okay, I can also see any trucks that have had of it, have a vehicle or a rig check started, but not complete yet, engine one. And so play with these filters, teach the guys to play with it. And that way, you know, those of you that have a large fleet, it'll pare that down and they'll just have to worry about their vehicles. So it's broken down again, same organization as the main grid by end first type. I'm gonna go down to engine one, 11 here, engine one. This is what I wanted to point it out. People go, well, well, we are running engine, we're running as engine one. Let me rephrase that. Engine one today is switched in to and become engine two. That's all right. It's gonna still show engine one here. That's okay. This is the key. What physical vehicle am I checking? It's 9990. I'm calling it engine two today. It's gonna go back being engine one once engine, the main engine two comes back um, in service. But 
it's 99.90 and that's what I'm going to check. All right. And you can see it's showing out of service because I took it out of service, but we're still gonna do a check. Now I've got the form here, but this icon here, edit checklist, is where I create those forms. All right, and many of you, half of you have said that you're using this already, so this is probably just a refresher, but a couple things to keep in mind. There's no limit to the line items you can put here, okay? And these forms are really just basic rudimentary forms we're playing around with, but I wanna show you. I'm creating them. These are, you can include or, in, or exclude the odometer, pump, or engine hour readings. And then you can go in and create your compartments questions within the compartment and i suspect a couple of the questions you guys all might ask is i would love to have a sub checklist for say my scbas all right because right now i'm going to create a compartment called you know left high side or in this case cab we'll just call it cab and i've got my scbas but you'll want to maybe have more detailed checks now one thing you can do now, this has just been introduced not too long ago. Um, I know that there are enhancements coming to this. Um, the product owner is working on doing more um, to make this even more uh, more powerful and um, the things that our customers are asking for. But in the meantime, what could be done is you could make a compartment called SCBA1 and then get down into the weeds here. So it is a, is it a little bit of a workaround? It is but it still allows you to capture in a very linear, simple format when you're out checking the vehicle, spe specific parts of a unique piece of equipment. So it's taking a compartment and making it into a piece of equipment and then the things that you have to check regarding it if it's more than just a pass-fail you know, component, like an SCBA. Serial number you might have to enter, pressure, mainline valve functioning, and so forth. So it does give you that ability to do that. Okay, one of the things I know that the product owner is exploring, it may not be coming in the next release, but a lot of you have asked for when I fail something to be able to be prompted to do a work order. He's looking into that, the complexity of developing that. Um, again, not sure if that will happen, but let's, I want you to know that your feedback has been listened to and the product owner is exploring um, what the, how much development bandwidth, we call it, um, level of effort it would be to do something like that. So keep that in mind. But now I'm still editing this form so I can go in and I've got all my compartments, pardon the scroll here, I'll add a new one and keep building the form. The nice thing is once you've built the form, you published it for use and you can then clone it and assign it to another apparatus. So if I wanna use this form, I can assign it to any other apparatus in my fleet. So let's say we want this available for engine four. I duplicate and assign and it's gonna actually take me to engine four. You can see the vehicle number. Now this form is being used here, but let's say this is a unique vehicle and it has some specialized equipment on it. Say it has your extrication tools, all right? But engine one didn't, no problem. You just go into the cab that it's in or the compartment that it's in, excuse me, and add questions as you see fit. And so you're taking an existing form and modifying it for a new apparatus. Does anyone have any questions, any pain points you've encountered as far as creating forms within RigCheck? All right, so let's do a check. But before we do that, I'm gonna to have to set something up to show you how I like to teach it now because our, our team did such a good job here that it's quite fun to look at and work with. Minimize, reduce that. All right, so you're gonna see my phone come up here. And this is something, if you haven't taught everybody that checks checks vehicles, you're gonna to wanna to consider it. Okay, so you should be seeing my phone here momentarily. All right, so what I've done is I've created a shortcut on my desktop on my phone. You can see it right there, rig check. And what it does is it takes me directly to my login page. Now, it's really not going to the login page. Well, it's going to the login page, but the URL behind this is going to take me directly to this page here on my phone. Okay, so let me put in my password. Too many, too many, where is it? I'm using my, there it is. 
Okay, so now I'm gonna log in, but it takes me directly to it because of how I've saved it on my phone. And if you don't know how to do this, I can actually show you. So here I am logged in. So focus in on my phone. I know there's the background there, but focus in on my phone. So now I'm gonna go check the vehicle. I'm gonna tap start check. I'm gonna pick my form. And you can see that I started one but didn't finish. So I'm gonna continue checking. We just got back from a call. I gotta to finish today's check check. And then I go through and fill it out. Now there was a bug in my account that was preventing, on the pump hours that was preventing me from completing this. We'll see if it's still there. So now I found something that failed. And so I'm gonna put in some notes. I can take a picture. And so it's very simple. I don't have to go find the file. I simply take it, there's my keyboard. I use the photo and it's gonna load directly into that into the check form. I can keep going while it's doing that. And again, you, many of you have done this, so I'm not gonna like go into, okay, this, we're just gonna fly through the form. And again, I'm walking around the truck, getting all this done. And I wanted to fail one item so you can see how it appears. Now, I might get a bug here. So if I do, yeah, there's something wrong with my account. You guys won't encounter this, but it's not its not taking my pump hours. So let me, let me go back here and show you what's gonna happen once I do this. But again, I would complete the form and then I'm done. Put my phone back in my pocket and we're good to go. So let's go back here. It should say 19, continue checking. It's going to drive me nuts if it does it here again. So pump, see, it's not keeping my pump hours. Yeah, it's something is up here. So we're going to, I want to show you what happens because you need to see this. So guys, I apologize for that. So we're going to do this. I think this checklist is shorter even. Okay, apparatus. Got to publish it. Oh yeah, if it's in draft, you can't use it. It's like our inspection forms. If you don't lock it, it's not going to be able to be used. So we're gonna go here and publish. And so now I can use it. Okay. And it will let you know if you put in too much or the wrong numerical values. Okay, so I've got a fail item here. test, I can load the picture, submit, there we go. That form, my, my old form, it's broken, but this one worked. But what I wanted to show you, which you're probably aware of, is right here on the welcome page. You've got the start and stop time. I did it really fast, so it's a, less than a minute. But the, 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 the there's my default activity code rig check, the apparatus and vehicle ID. I use the new checklist form, who completed it, and anything that failed. And so you have in our reports section, reports that are pulling from the daily log that you can see run, let's just do it. Go to reports. So in addition to everything you have in maintenance for daybook reports, I go to daily log and I wanna see daily log items for personnel. I wanna see, For the month, just me, just rig checks. You've got a nice summary of all the vehicles you've checked and what you found. So now I could check all the engineers for that station for, and I'd see a nice list of all the vehicles and the checks over across all the shifts, pretty cool. Okay. Questions on rig check. Kervin's got a question. Um, any advances on linking the maintenance lines, i.e. SCB to create a record on that particular item? Uh, so if I understand the question, um, that is one of the things the product owner is exploring, uh, Kervin, is the ability to directly assign from the equipment list to the rig checklist. So in other words, it's directly corresponding to the equipment that you built. That is something they are exploring. Um, there has been a lot of asks for that. Um, not sure if it, um, if it will happen, but I know it's being explored. 
Okay, now for the general maintenance. Again, remember the standard talks about preventative maintenance program and the general maintenance and testing of a vehicle, right? So now we've got a vehicle and depending on the permissions you have set, you're welcome, uh, Kervin, absolutely. Um, oh, I'll just interrupt her for a second. A question from Amanda. So what would you say is the biggest difference between ER rig checks and Halligan? So the user interface is certainly different when you see it. Um, the basic Halligan that we have in our system gives you a limit of 50 line items. We do not have any limits in ER rig checks. Um, upgrading to Halligan Pro gives you a lot more functionality uh, than e and truck check basic. Um, and that I would say if you compare these two, you know, our rig check and truck check, the number one difference besides the inner, the, the, the look of it and the use of it, um, the, what we call the user interface UI um, is the character, the, the line item limit. Sometimes 50 is just not enough. And so then you'll bump over to rig check, you know, and that doesn't cost you anything extra. All right, so in the apparatus now, we're, we're at engine 11. Now here's the thing, you found a discrepancy, okay? You found the discrepancy with the vehicle during the check. The next step that you have to do is document that. You're gonna go to the gear icon and depending on your permissions, some you might just set for firefighters to request maintenance, that's fine. They're gonna find that they noticed that the right rear taillight is out. All right, they may document the apparatus hours, pump hours or miles. Most likely they're gonna document the miles when it comes to something like this. Obviously there's no fuel entry. It's, and let's say we're gonna put it back in service. So it's it's in service anyway. The description, um, let's see, right rear, light out, attempted bulb replacement, still out. All right, you can take a picture. I've had a guy do a little video clip. We had, when we were first implementing a different uh, way we were doing uh, rig checks in the amusement, the occupancy back in the day, uh, he actually loaded a video a video image right here because our the indicate tank indicator lights, even though the, it was full of water for the tank on the truck, it was showing and it was bouncing from you know one to nothing, a quarter tank to, to nothing despite it being full. And so instead of trying to describe it, he just did a video clip of it and it was excellent. And then we can request and close it and it will prompt you to send an email. And that email can go to multiple recipients, the captain, your fleet and external uh, fleet services. And then they can not only can, will it have the minor repair maintenance summarized here, you can also um, enter any other information manually and then shoot that email off to whoever needs to get it. And then you'll see that it's not assigned or not scheduled yet, but that's no problem. You can go in and assign and schedule. So we've got from request, first section, assign and schedule. Who's going to do it? You can build your vendor list in the administration module. So you can assign it to a vendor that does the work. If there's a change in any of this other information, you can do that, any other notes and any other files. And then again, if you have it a step-by-step, -step, assign, schedule and close, email will be prompted. You'll notice that the text goes black because it's, whoops, the text goes black because it is now scheduled and not past due. And then we go to complete it. We can enter the cost. No labor, again, any notes, any receipts, invoices can go here, complete and close. And you'll notice it is no longer pending. I can send an email again or not, and it is no longer on the pending maintenance list. And then here, all important is the history of everything done to that vehicle. So you can see the, the, the rig check that I did, the rig check I did just a few minutes ago and it's minor repair. Now, one of the things I want to show you in the rig check 
is if you ever need to print out that form again of what was done, it's gonna be at the top here. I'm gonna click that link, and now I've got a printable form of that day's rig check, if I ever need to pull it, you know, that specifically. All right, so we've done an introduction to the apparatus grid, some key fields within the apparatus edit page in the administration module, making sure that you've got a default activity code created for completed rig checks if you are using rig checks in our system. If you are using the Halligan truck check, it's going to default to the completed maintenance, but it will also appear in your daily log. It just won't be segregate, segregated as a unique activity code from all your other maintenance items. You've got the, the, the requesting, scheduling, and completing of a maintenance item, and then it all appears here in this table. All right, and so this is great for accessing individual maintenance and checks. But let's say I want a more comprehensive report. This isn't going to give you a report. These are. A couple reports I want to show you. Remember, one of the parts of NFP 1911 is replacement of vehicles. 1696. And again, I'm going to put a wide range of years because I don't know exactly when all of mine are going to be replaced, but I should capture. Because of the data, the entry that I put in in the administration module, I can at least give the chief that in 2026, well, let's go to 2029. Engine 71 cost us at the day 465,000. All right. Now for 2029, I can start planning my budget. Now, what I can do is take this out into Excel put a multiplier on it for inflation based on the number of years it's been in service and get a little uh, maybe more accurate amount of how much it will be to replace it. Again, high level budget planning. That's report 1696. A couple other reports I want to show you. Um, and then I'll show you fuel ER as well. Um, this one's really great. Those of you that do not necessarily have city pumps, you maybe use you know department credit cards, um, you have your own pumps and you need to document fuel. If you don't have the fancy system where when you pull up, it knows RFID, your that vehicle, how much you used, and it goes off electronically, this is a great way to document it. And you can see total fuel consumption for your fleet. That's report 1753. Two more reports, and then I'll go back to FuelER to wrap up our presentation today. Um, this is a big one. Apparatus out of service. See how it's got apparatus, but vehicle number. I don't care about the, the name. I need to know. 9990. Whoops. In 2019, how much time did it was it spent? How much time did this truck spend out of service? 14 days and 13 minutes. That's huge for our DOD customers, and it's probably important to all of you when Chief wants to know the percentage of in-service vehicle utilization, okay? If this, if you find a vehicle that's out a lot, it's like, well, then that's a red flag. What's, you probably know it's, it's a weak link in your fleet, but this gives you the data to back it up. 1,700, and then the last one is 1,699. I want to see everything done on that vehicle, or I just want to see my routine inspections da, 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 right here from my entire fleet. And you can see the new, new checklist, how much time, if there was any um, dollars or this one, show this one with rig checks, it won't show dollars and cost because there's nothing associated with it, but it will give you a summary of that vehicle. So you could get a rundown um, if you've got consistent brake issues and things like this, this allows you to see it at a glance um, without having to go in necessarily to the maintenance module and, and do more clicks and such. All right, last thing we'll show you is Fuel ER. This is our, our standalone progressive web app. You log in just like you would log into emergency reporting. And it's pick an apparatus, engine one. No, engine one, please. Thank you. We put in fuel. 
diesel exhaust fluid, if there is any, odometer, apparatus hours, cost, notes, if any, log fuel usage. Hold on, I gotta re-log in twice because of my browser remembering. There we go. That's a lot of fuel. And just to show you, we're gonna log it. You'll get this to conf or confirm it. Click submit. That fuel that I just did. Engine, remember I did it for engine one. So it's a fuel entry. Go to its history. And there it is right there today's date. And that entry that I put in is all right here. So again, if you don't have a, a, a fancy electronic uh, fleet system where truck pulls up, you grab the pump, it talks to the pump, talks to the truck, truck talks to the pump, and it documents it remotely. Um, this is a super tool and it's a single purpose an elegantly simple single purpose app. And again, it works great on a mobile device as well. So we are near the top of the hour. Um, I hope you found this helpful today. Um, we did a quick introduction of two really important standards that you now know how to reference as you build your um, uh, fleet inspection, maintenance and testing program. Um, we learned um, some things in the administration module. We learned some things in the apparatus grid both for rig checks as well as for performing any kinds of maintenance. And of course, we uh, did a quick visit to Fuel ER. So all of those things we showed you will help support your ability to enhance um, your adherence to those two standards we talked about today. So with that, let's talk some questions here. Um, so Amanda, there's a lot of different things Halligan Pro does, um, um, and I'm not as familiar with it as I am with Halligan Basic because Halligan Basic was part of our system. Um, but I do know that there are some things that Halligan Pro does do that ER rig checks does not, and then we're looking very hard at um, enhancing those features to be even more competitive with them. But keep in mind, everybody, all of our customers get um, rig checks. And uh, again, I'm a big fan of it. I think our development team did an outstanding job, both in the simplicity of it and then the ability to use it on a mobile device. Ah, another question, Amanda, are there trip sheets, driver reports in ER? So be a little more specific what you mean by that. Um, we don't have forms, pre-built forms in the system. So t um, for, for rig checks, uh, like we and, and we have some templates in for like inspections and such, but nothing for rig checks. So maybe be a little more specific on what what those are about. Trip sheets and driver reports is that? Uh, what is that? I think I know, but I want to hear what what you guys uh, what you're doing there, Amanda. And then if there's any other questions, um, just type it in there, and uh, I'll do my best to address them. Sean, thanks a lot. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, yeah, there's so many so many neat things and as far as helping you become more NFPA compliant. And like I said, we're halfway through the 20, 20 for 2020 webinars and there'll be more to come. Um, and if there's any topics that you'd like to see guys, drop me an email. You know, it's real easy, Tom, T-O-M, at emergencyreporting.com. If there's something you'd like to see or an NFPA standard that you're trying to do better with, um, we'd love to do a webinar on it. Um, we've got more coming up. In fact, let's go there. Um, the next one I'm going to be doing is, and if you ever wonder where to register, you, you'll see it on our login page, but what you want to do is go to resources on our, on just the emergency reporting.com, our marketing page, resources, webinars, and go to educational webinars. So I highly, highly recommend guys. They, they did one today, but there'll be recordings of it where we did a partner spotlight with Spotted Dog, our in route um, partner. Um, which was really cool. There's today's. And then on March 12th, um, we're going to talk about training records. So that's NFPA 1401. So if you're going to come back in a couple of weeks, go study NFPA 1401 and come come to me with lots of questions because our training module really does a great job helping, uh, helping you adhere to that standard. And are any of you going to the Center for Public Safety Excellence Conference in Orlando next week? If you are, we will be there. Uh, my boss, 
um, and the, the co-founder of the company, he will be there as well. Um, we'll have a table there. So if you're coming out to Orlando, come by and say hi, spend some time with us. Um, I'd like to meet you in person. Um, oh, Amanda. So she goes, so this is um, trip sheets and driver reports. Going back to that, every time the truck goes out, miles are logged, who drove it, and a pump generator. Oh, that's really cool. Okay. And the pump generator. So every time the vehicle pulls out, they have that documentation. Is that right, Amanda? So it's not a check. It's just, hey, I get in the truck. I'm doing a run to the store. I need to document who did it, the miles on the odometer, who drove it in the pump generator hours. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. Okay. So let me think about that. Is it more important because what I want to do is to be as effective as you can be with this um, for the user, because we want to make it as easy as possible. I suppose, and I'll give you a couple options and you can kind of see what you think would be best. I'm not sure if I would consider that maintenance, although you certainly could document it as an other and you call it um, trip sheet. Here's why this might work, trip sheet. You can put in the hours. Okay, you can put in the miles. Those are two things. And then the miles logged, you can certainly put that in description. And then click complete, actually go straight to complete. And then document it. And yeah, I think this might be good only because it has separate fields for the things that you're tracking. All right, apparatus hours, pump hours and miles. Okay. Now, if you need to put in the return miles, this could be the miles out. And then you could put in miles back in here if you need to do that. And if anyone else has any suggestions here, please chime in for Amanda, because you may have a better idea than I have. And then they could just complete and close it. Alternative number two, which is not quite as nice because of the different fields, is you could create an activity code for the daily log. They, the guys will like this better, but what you're capturing may not be sufficient. You could put in Start, start in and out time. Activity code would be trip sheet. And I don't have one, but let's pretend. Let's call it move up. I could put in hours, miles right here, my apparatus, and then click add. This is faster, but there's not separate fields for those other data points. But maybe this will be enough for you. So those are two options. Does anyone listening have any other ideas for Amanda? If I'm a firefighter, I like this one. If I'm a chief, I might like the other one better. But again, ask yourself what's most important, just the logging of it and then the ability to run a quick report because the reports for these are really fantastic too. So I could run a report on just that activity code, in this case, move up, or like in your case, trip sheet and have all my trip sheets on one report and it will show up here. I just won't be able to mine the data quite as easily in the notes. Does that help? All right, guys, well, we'll see you on March 12th. And yep, you're welcome, Amanda. We'll see you on March 12th. Have a wonderful weekend. Thanks for joining me this Friday. And keep in mind, March 12th is a Thursday. Um, we're going to, we're doing our very best to not have to change these dates. Just sometimes my travel schedule screws things up. We're, we're working on getting a backup so we can keep the schedule in, in shape. And then if I get called out, um, someone else will back me up and do the presentation so we don't have to mess with your schedules. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Um, stay safe and we'll catch you in a couple of weeks.